<laughs> so welcome everybody to our Discover Longer Doc session with Richard Lane. My name is Lydia Harrison MW. I'm an educator at the WST School in London and in charge of our events program. So we have been going virtual obviously this year, lots of webinars um, online and Richard Lane uh, is one of our current diploma students. I think he's nervously awaiting his D3 results. So hopefully he will soon be Richard Lane Dip WSET. And he has li lived in the Bergerac region, but also visited the Longer Dock several times when he was living in Bergerac in France. So he is going to present this evening. And as I say, I will take, uh, I will keep an eye on the chat. And if there's any questions, pop them in there and I will put them to Richard a little bit later on. Um, but yes, please, uh, you can find, if you enjoy this, you can find all of our other webinars um, on our YouTube channel or via the WST School website, wstschool.com. And yes, without further ado, I will hand over to Richard. So Richard, I shall just click onto your castle slide now and take it away. Thank you very much, Lydia. And uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone, all 250, whatever you plus of you terrifying thought and a special bonsoir to our friends in France. I know we've got at least three or four people in the Languedoc who have, who have joined this call, which is slightly terrifying because they're clearly going to know far more about the Languedoc than myself. But as uh, Lydia says, yeah, I'm really delighted to be doing this. I cannot believe how many wine webinars I've attended this year. They've kept me sane or maybe insane during this year. Um, and But actually to be presenting one, uh, on behalf of WACT to you lot internationally is really is a thrill actually. So thank you all very much for turning up. And uh, yeah, so longer dog. I, I mean, as, as Lydia says, uh, I was in France for a year with my wife Liz and our dog Topper over the 2017, 2018. And although we weren't based in longer dog, we certainly visited it a few times as we were traveling around and we have friends living down there and immediately realized what an extraordinary uh, interesting uh, region, wine region, not just wine region, but region it is, and the wine region itself, very much so, but clearly wanted to know more about it. So here we are. But <clears throat> to start this seminar, I'm actually going to give you a quote. <clears throat> Excuse me. This quote comes from, I'm sure you've all heard of Oz Clark. Uh, he is quite a character. He's lived his life to the full. He is a brilliant writer. And if anyone is out there studying, like I have been recently for WACT exams, and you want a break from your study books, you can do far worse than read his book that came out a year or two ago called Red and White. It is basically a 650 page romp around the world of wine with Oz Clark. And um, this is what he says when he gets to the south of France. He's just come down the Rhone Valley, okay? And this is what he says, I'm, I'm quoting directly from the book. I'm standing on a bridge in the middle of Arles in Provence, facing south, bestriding the mighty Rhone as it powers on. Shall I turn left or right, east or west? To the east is the glitter and glamour of Provence. But what promise of wine? Not nearly enough. To my right is the rough and tumble of the Languedoc, where the sun seems harsher, where the wind seems keener, where the beach bars are few, ooh, and where the restaurants are little more than cafes serving fresh fish and salad. But the promise of special wine is tantalizing. So, wow. I mean, only I can't put it into words like, like Austin, but I just think that is just a wonderful little entree <clears throat> into, into the world of the longer dog. It is um, such an extraordinary place. And in terms of its wine history, it's such an interesting history. And I realize I'm actually taking on the impossible tonight because there's no way that I can cover the wine region of the longer dog uh, in any great depth in one hour. And so apologies in advance, that's just some bits of it are just not going to be possible. But I hope you get a good overview. The Languedoc, it's, it's, it's like France in many ways, it's a land of paradoxes. It's full of rules if you're in the appellation system for the wines, but it's also, there are no rules if you don't want to be part of that system. 
it's in the south of France. So you're thinking, well, we're going to be talking about red wine because it's a Mediterranean climate. Well, yeah, but we're also talking about white wine, pink wine, sparkling wine, fortified wine. The Lang Languedoc has it all. The Languedoc has a long history, a checkered history, which I'm going to cover just a little bit because you can't really understand what the Languedoc is doing and it is definitely going through a revolution this since the millennium the past 20 years you can't really understand where it's going unless you know a little bit about its past and to me that's what makes wine fascinating actually not getting obsessed with the history books but just knowing enough about it the cultural context which makes the understanding of today more relevant so yeah it's got a checkered history but it's got an exciting future and i say i think that future really has already begun so where on earth are we? Well, we're in the south of France. Next slide, please, Lydia. Let's look at the map. I want to call the Languedoc, and please, no offence to those of you tonight who are living in the Languedoc, I want to call it the Wild West. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a compliment, I think. But it's not, I can't use the word West because that would be misleading. It's definitely South. You can see from the map, we're in the deep South. It's circled there on the map. Um, we're in the Western Mediterranean. France is a big country, as you know. If you can see Bordeaux to the northwest of the Languedoc, Bordeaux is 300 kilometers northwest of the Languedoc. So from Bordeaux to Carcassonne is about 200 miles, 300 kilometers. Not that close, and the climate is very, very different. To the east, you can see, as Oz Clark was just to Rome, that's to the east of the region. And that clearly has had an influence, as we're going to discover, on the shape of the Languedoc over the past 50 years or so. But also to the south, and this, people often get confused here, so we just need to sort this out. Administratively, the Languedoc was often cluttered together with Roussillon, and it, and it was until quite recently the region was called, just generally in France, Languedoc-Roussillon. Um, the Roussillon actually is a separate, certainly in terms of wine, is a separate region and we're not talking about Roussillon tonight. Roussillon clearly is to the south and goes down to the Spanish border. And Roussillon is, in wine terms, is a tenth, 10% 10 of the size of the Languedoc, okay? So let's drilling down into a little bit more detail. The next slide, please, Lydia. So this is the regional map, and obviously you can see the sea, um, and also you can see these coloured zones. I mean, I'll just pick out a few of them, because as I said, can't talk about every part of the Languedoc tonight. I mean, otherwise we'll really will be here till midnight. Um, but just a couple of things, starting from the left, if you like, top left, and then moving in sort of columns uh, to the right, to the east. Uh, Cabarets and Malapair around Carcassonne, the top left, those are in the green areas there. We're going to touch on those a bit in a minute. They're quite interesting because climatically they are different to the rest of Languedoc. And that's where the Atlantic influence, although the Atlantic's a long way away, does have a little bit of, a, of influence. Carcassonne, you can see there, that's just a place you've got to visit. I mean, you've got to go into Carcassonne just because it's an extraordinary historic city. Wander around the inner walled city and you feel like you're on the film set of Gladiator or something. It's amazing. Um, so near Carcassonne, of course, you've got, as I said, you can see the places there. Um, to the right, in the pink here, you've got Minervois. Bonsoir to people from the Minervois tonight. I know we've got some on the call. On the call. Um, Minervois, La Lavinière, we're going to talk about that. That is a kind of Grand Cru of the Languedoc, which is exciting. Um, Saint-Jean de Minervois, we'll touch on briefly, famous for its fortified muscat, fortified wine. But south of um, Minervois, the, the yellow region, Corbière, again, Corbière seems to have been around forever, although as an appellation, it's only been going since 1985. It's the fourth largest um, appellation in France, actually, uh, after Bordeaux and Côte du Rhône and Champagne. So it's a big odd region, Corbière. And then coming, and Fitou, you can see sandwiched in between there as well. Down there, down there, that's right on the border of uh, Roussillon, so you're heading down towards Spain. And then in the turquoise colours, in the middle of the Languedoc, you've got these fantastic appellations, Saint-Chignon, um, coming down, La Clappe is quite new, 
um, famous particularly for um, Mourvedre, because it's a very warm area, but also um, Bouvolonc, the white wine variety that you also get in the Rhone Valley. And then coming across east from there, Fougere, again, Fougere quite close to saint chinion really interesting geology, soils, terroir, which they're still really exploring because as we're going to discover tonight, the, the Languedoc is still actually, even though it's been going, <laughs> been producing wine probably since the Greeks back in the fifth century BC, in terms of getting a real grip on itself, it's still fairly early days. Then as you come across, you can see um, to the right of Fougere, the Terrasse du Lazac, up and coming, almost continental climate there, quite cool. Some marvellous wine being, making, uh, being, being made there. Back down on the coast, I'm sure you've heard of Picbull de Pinay, the white wine that the Brits love so much. They've only, that's only been in Appalachian since 2009, and the British drink nearly all of it, either on holiday or in the restaurants back here. And then you can see, going to the right again, Pic saint Lou, very trendy, modern Appalachian, very exciting. And it's very close to the city of Montpellier. And I cannot, um, you cannot underestimate how important Montpellier is. It's a really large city. Um, it's, um, it's got a lot of industry, pharmaceuticals, etc. but it's also got a fantastic university. And a lot of the research work that's going on in viticulture, winemaking in the region is influenced by the enology programs at the University of Montpellier. If you're studying enology in France, you're probably gonna be studying it in Montpellier, or in Bordeaux, or in uh, Dijon, in Burgundy. And then you can see to the east, up where the, by Os Clark standing on the Rhone there, you've got Nîmes, um, which used to be Languedoc, but is now considered part of uh, the Rhone, the, Rhone, the Southern Rhone, okay. So that shows you the region. And just some statistics while we're still looking at this map, and they are quite extraordinary, because the Languedoc is a huge region. And of course, just because it's big doesn't mean it's all good or great, but I mean, just in terms of numbers, they are striking. Area under vine, Languedoc, 220,000 hectares. Okay, that's twice the size of Bordeaux, okay? But unlike Bordeaux, not all of the Languedoc is under Appalachian control. And I'm gonna to have to explain a bit about French Appalachian control in a bit. Please don't leave the meeting early, okay? It does help understand the structure of the Languedoc. Um, in terms of its production, the figures vary that I've been looking at, but you wouldn't be surprised, those of you in the know or studying diploma, but with 220,000 hectares under vine, it produces a heck of a lot of wine. We're talking something like over a billion litres of wine a year. We're talking though, 13 million hectolitres, a hectolitres, a hectolitres 100. So, you know, we're talking about the Languedoc having the area under vine similar to a country like Argentina. More wine produced or similar volumes produced to Australia, probably a bit more than Chile, depending on El Nino in Chile, gives you a sense of the size. So if the Languedoc wasn't part of France, the Languedoc would be one of the largest wine grain countries in the world. It's kind of extraordinary. Um, is that, and so the Languedoc is actually responsible for 5% of the world's wine, which I think, again, is pretty remarkable. Doesn't mean all those wines are great, but some of them are very good, and, and a lot of them are getting better, as we will discover. There are around um, 25 Appalachians. They change a lot, um, but some recent additions and some in the pipeline, um, mainly dealing with once you're in the Appalachian system with red wines dominating within the Appalachian system at about 90%. But when we start talking about wine more broadly outside the Appalachians as well, then the red wine ratio drops to about 75 with rosé and white coming in at sort of 15, 10%. Um, who's making the wine in the Long Dock? Um, there are over 2000 individual producers making wine in the Languedoc. I mean, that's a lot of producers. Some of those producers have tiny plots, uh, aren't making much wine, but um, that's a lot of producers. So therefore, you can imagine quality is going to be variable and certainly has been and still is. These mention cooperatives as well. And if you're thinking, some of you are thinking, if you're not studying wine, what, what's on about, about a cooperative? Really important part of the wine culture in France. It's a bit like pubs in England, cooperative wine producers in France. I mean, they're just everywhere. And in France, every village where you make wine has a cooperative. 
I mean, historically, it's because often you'd have peasant farmers growing grapes, but not knowing how to make wine. And they would sell their grapes to a co cooperative. So a cooperative may have many members collecting loads of grapes, buying grapes, and then doing the winemaking. And cooperatives are part of the Languedoc scene, part of the French wine scene, although not so much in other wine areas, but in the Languedoc, definitely. And although there are 220 cooperatives in the Languedoc, that number is actually down from 550, 40 years ago, where 40 years ago, as we we're going to discover, the priority of the Languedoc was producing as much wine as possible. High volume, inexpensive wine into supermarkets and elsewhere was the priority, and the cooperatives were the kings and queens of that. It has to be said, some of the cooperatives are absolutely brilliant. And uh, as we'll see, and I'll mention later on, um, to be a cooperative is not a negative or pejorative term. Yes, they fulfill a, fun fulfill a function for high volume turnover of wines being sold to French supermarkets, but some of them are increasingly involved in quality wine production. So they're an important part of 21st century Languedoc. Right, enough of maps and figures. If you're still awake, next uh, slide, please, Lydia. Just want to talk a little bit about climate, not too much, and, and about soils and, and terroir, which we struggle a bit with the word terroir, but I mean, in France, they talk about terroir all the time. So I think we need to sort of talk about it. But with this slide, I want a few things here. You can see um, vines here, and you can see we're on a hill. So let's talk about altitude, first of all, because what you couldn't see from, that, from the map previously is that, yes, we're in the Mediterranean here, but actually only if you're very close to the sea, say within five, 10 kilometers, is the land really flat. As you head out towards the northern part of those regions we've just looked at, you're heading towards the massive central, and actually that means there's altitude. You up to maybe 500, pick San Lu, 650 meters, something like that. Why is that important? Well, it's really important, actually, particularly in the 21st century, because as the Languedoc has been going through starting its revolution this millennium, so has extreme weather and climate change. Uh, you've only got to look at vintages and weather reports of this millennium, the past 20 years. And I mean, just take the Languedoc, um, golly, take last year, 2019, when there were those two European heat waves. Temperatures in the Languedoc and off towards Nîmes to the east of the region hit 45, 46 degrees, um, you know, on a couple of occasions. Um, you know, this is, um, this is territory that we haven't really gone into before. It's always been warm, of course. It's a Mediterranean climate. But while temperature is one thing, um, as we'll see in a sec, drought is another. But just on the temperatures, the altitude is really, really important because if you are growing grapes and the temperatures are getting warmer and warmer, the thing that you're at risk of losing is freshness from your grapes when those temperatures get too high. So if you can plant your vines at altitude, you are going to have effects of cool winds and nighttime temperatures. And so if you're in places like Minervois and um, Terrasse du Larzac, some of these places you just saw on the map, the difference between daytime and nighttime temperature can be 20 degrees centigrade. And we know so much difference, particularly to the UK, where the differences aren't huge. And the closer you get to the sea, you could be down on the Mediterranean and the difference between night, night and day might be five degrees centigrade. Go inland 50 kilometers and go up four or 500 meters and you will get 20 degrees difference. Why does that matter? It matters because you can retain acidity in your grapes and your wines will be fresh and potentially be more age worthy, uh, more interesting. You'll slow the ripening of the grapes, which means you'll get more subtle aromas developing you'll end up with better wine. You might even be able to make more, wine, more money for selling that wine too. So actually, ripening grapes is all very well, but actually it's straightforward in the Mediterranean climate. These days, it's about slowing the process and, and the altitude is important. So yet yeah, sunny, there are 300 sunny-ish days. I mean, I'm sure the others listening tonight in the longer doc may, may disagree with that. But from my research, that's what I've come, come up with. It is pretty sunny. Uh, it's pretty windy as well, actually. It's not quite as bad as my experience um, of, of being in, in Provence with that Mistral blowing down the Rhone Valley, which is just insane. But you often do get a prevailing, funny enough, a northwesterly wind. And that's, that's actually important too, because that keeps, helps keep the yields of the grapes quite low. 
because you get this kind of evapotranspiration thing going on from the grapes and that keeps the yields low and keeping grape yield low is a good indicator of you know, ensuring there's going to be some quality there so that's important too the other thing just before we move on from this slide can you see these lovely rocks can you see the limestone outcrops on this i hope you can there's another thing that this, this picture shows and actually limestone is really important um i'm not going to go massively into soil and geology because i don't know a great deal about geology but what i do know is everywhere i've been in france every wine region i've been to in france and i've asked them about the soil and terroir they usually say the same thing the the the, the, the experts the viticulturists the vineyard owners they go, oh, argile calcaire, clay, lime, clay and limestone. Here we're looking at limestone, these limestone outcrops. And they do, again, do two useful things, just to bear in mind. Limestone is alkaline. And actually that's important because that helps retain freshness in fruit because uh, you want to retain acidity in your fruit. And by having this kind of yin and yam thing between acidity and alkalinity, limestone's good for, for keeping fruit fresh and acidic. The other thing limestone's good at is retaining water, because as we'll see from the next slide, <laughs> it's the sea, it's not the slide I thought, but a quick mention of the sea, the opposite to the altitude. Uh, of course, we've got the Mediterranean. So you're going to get some sea breezes, of course, which can help keep things cool and fresh and ripe. And think of those white wine appellations like uh, Pico de Pine, and maybe the white wines at La Clap, so the Mediterraneans can have a little bit of a breeze, but generally you're not gonna have that diurnal range you get up in the hills. Okay. But the next slide, thank you, is um, where we're looking at gushing water. I promise this is rainwater. It's not drain water, it's rainwater. This uh, lovely, uh, lovely looking gargoyle in uh, Carcassonne when uh, Liz and I were there uh, two, three years ago. Um, it's an interesting one because when you look at look, look at the rain figures in the longer dot, it's about it again. You can't generalize. Up in uh, Terrasse du Larzac or some of the other places can be up to a thousand millimeters, like Bordeaux. But generally, it's about 550, 600, which is enough. But it doesn't rain on that many days uh, in the longer dot. And I mean, the most extreme example of that, if you can believe this. Uh, in Corbière and um, parts of the Minervois 20 years ago, they had their annual rainfall, 550 mils, in 36 hours. Oh my goodness me. So when it rains, as we found out in Carcassonne, when it rains, oh my God, it rains. It's extraordinary, the intensity of it. But you do get a lot of drought. And this is the increasing problem with, with um, extreme weather and, and, and um, global warming. And Clearly, that's causing hydric stress, and some of you know a little, little bit of stress to the vines is no bad thing, but a lot of stress is not good. And this is, going to, is representing a problem, particularly with a grape variety like Syrah, which is planted widely in the Languedoc. Syrah does not like drought. Um, so looking ahead, that could be a problem for the region as they start to look at, well, which have to start to look at other varieties and which ones are going to be most adapted and suited to this increasingly warm climate. Right, next slide please, Lydia. Um, this is the port of Set. Why am I showing you a picture of the port? Um, this is Set, as I said, it's quite near Montpellier. Montpellier is not a port. Set is the nearest port. Um, and this is why I just have to give you a tiny, tiny bit of history before we then really crack on with moving forward. Um, as I've mentioned, um, wine started ap appearing in the Languedoc, probably fifth century BC with the Greeks. They found various pottery pots and fossils and things and to kind of prove that. Picked up, continued by the Romans, of course, who were around these parts. And then um, sort of jumping forward a thousand years, the medieval period, very important. Lots of, um, uh, lots of, mo lots of monastery, lots, lots of monasteries, lots of abbeys, Catholic church, um, requiring wine for the for the sacrament that's all part of the Catholic Church culture which of course is so strong in France and particularly wine region wine region parts of France absolutely but um, before I talk about sets just need to mention a couple of other things in the 17th century 
something called the Canal du Midi was created. Because the Languedoc, I mean, we take it for granted now with motorways and trains and planes and everything, but can you imagine before any transportation, how cut off these regions were? So they could produce lots of wine, but could they export it or get it anywhere? But the Canal du Midi connected the Mediterranean coast with the Atlantic coast. And if you want to take a very slow holiday, I haven't done it. If you want to go one mile an hour on a boat, <laughs> that's the Canal du Midi is for you. Um, so that opened up trade, at least to the rest of France and to Paris from the 17th century onwards. So I can't believe that the Bordelais were overly keen to um, deal with the wines from, from the Midi down here in the Languedoc. But I mean, what was more important in the 19th century, two really significant things happened. First was the coming of the railways all the way down to um, you know, Perpignan, Mont um, Montpellier, Marseille, and up to Paris, 1850s onwards. That meant that the vast wine productions going on in Languedoc could be moved around France. And that became increasingly important with industrialization that was happening in the north of France, in the late 19th century. Then you had World War I, and of course later World War II, and wine became a very important daily ration of French soldiers. They had to have some cheap wine, and it all came from the Languedoc. It was called Le Gros Rouge, it was probably seven or eight percent alcohol, pale, red, and was in probably in terms of our palates today, pretty undrinkable. What has this got to do with the port of Set? <laughs> well, the Gros Rouge that was being produced with just unbelievable industrial scale viticulture all along the sandy plains of um, the Languedoc, close to the sea. Why the sandy plains? Because the other thing that happened in the second half of the 19th century, a bug, a louse called phylloxera, an aphid, arrived in Europe unwittingly from America, where it didn't affect their vines, but it affected European vines. And it chomped its way around the vine world and uh, was an absolute disaster. So by the early 20th century, replanting of vines had to be done. And in Languedoc, they found that if they planted vines, close to the sea in the sandy fertile plain, the very hot area of the plain, the phylloxera louse did not like those sandy soils. So you ended up with a huge outdoor factory of vines being produced to produce Le Gros Rouge, pearlish red wine, for workers in the industrial north and the soldiers of the First and Second World War. But it was so bad and, and weak, seven or eight percent, and I'll tell you the great varieties in a second that were responsible. They had to fortify it, not with alcoholic spirit, but with slightly stronger wine. And in those days, Algeria was a French colony. It was a French colony right up until 1962. So Set, the port of Set, received all the boats from Algeria, where the wine was stronger, and they, they added, they topped up the Gros Rouge from the Languedoc with a slightly stronger wine of Algeria, which is called the Vin de Médecin wine of the doctors, uh, to make it just about bearable before they put it onto the trains and got it up to Paris in the north and obviously the troops during those wars. It's really interesting history that. But it meant, as a result of all that, that the Languedoc, France generally, and Languedoc, because Languedoc was producing most of France's wine, had a massive overproduction problem. In the 1910s, 1920s, um, France was producing something unbelievable, like 200 million hectolitres of wine a year. I mean, just can hardly believe it. But that's when the average consumption was something like 130 litres of wine per capita. It's probably now about, I don't know, 30 or 40 or something. Although admittedly it was weaker stuff. But anyway, um, they had a huge overproduction problem. Um, because the vines they'd been planting, made from Carignan and Aramon, were producing 200 hectolitres per hectare for those students out there who like statistics. When you consider that today, under the Appalachian rules, Languedoc's producing on average around 35 to 40 hectolitres per hectare, you can see how things have changed. So it's a massive overproduction problem. When you've got too much wine that you can't sell, the price plummets, of course. Um, the cooperative system I mentioned earlier was created to help deal, to help produce this massive production, but, it but it, we ended up, the result was 
lots and lots of really appalling wine and something had to be done about it. So what did the French authorities do? They created the Appellation Controle system in the 1930s. And this overproduction problem across France, but Languedoc in particular was really, really responsible for that. Very important to know that in terms of general wine history. So even today at 220 hectares under vine, which is an awful lot, actually it's half what it was only 50 years ago. So within my lifetime, the Languedoc was twice the size it is now in terms of areas under vine. And that's why as recently as the 1970s and 1980s, a guy called Jacques Chirac, remember him? He became president of France. He was the agricultural minister. And this is when, this is when the vine pool scheme ha happened because of what happened, we ended up with, I'm sure you've all heard of it, the European wine lake. It wasn't just France's problem, it happened in Southern Italy as well. Overproduction of really not very good quality wine. So farmers or owners of land or vineyards were paid by the government um, and the European Union to pull up vines, uh, to pull up these high yielding Carignan and Aramon red, white, black variety wines that had caused the problem way back when. Okay. End of history lesson for the moment. Next slide, please, Lydia. This is just some vines down by the sea and I just wanted to actually to talk about white wine uh, for a little bit, mainly sort of, I guess, within the Appalachian structure first, but I am gonna talk a bit later about IGP wines and the broader wine scene. Okay, so this is um, Picpoul. This is a view close to Picpoul. There's a little place called Pinay. Picpoul is the grape. I've already mentioned it, so I don't need to loiter too long. It's a lovely, refreshing, they call it the lip stinger. Um, and it's great because it, retains its acidity, even down there by the very warm sea, by the Etang du Tau, which is a sort of big kind of lake next to the Mediterranean. And most of the white wines of the Languedoc have really started occurring in the 21st century. Um, and that's really, again, mainly because in, in the latter part of the 20th century, winemaking practices got so much better. Temperature control and f fermentation obviously being the main thing, because you've got to keep that, those temperatures cool when you're making white wine. Okay, but when we're also talking about white wine, just to mention the other key varieties, and they do crop up elsewhere, Grenache Blanc, and you find it in the Southern Rhone, is important. Bourbonlanc, again, from the Southern Rhone, but also in the Languedoc. And Maccabeo, particularly as you head down towards Corbiere, Maccabeo is Viura in Rioja. So you can already see actually, can't you? Just looking at white wine, you've got Grenache Blanc and you've got Maccabeo, which is Viura. Those are the varieties that make up white Rioja in northern Spain, northeastern Spain. So you can see, although in France, we're sort of already overlapping into some Spanish territory here. Right, next slide, please, Lydia. This is the pretty town of Limoux, which wasn't on the map earlier, but it's up near, it's pretty close to Carcassonne, so in that upper left region quite cool here um, and they make really fab white wine as well. But I really wanted to mention it very briefly because this is why the Languedoc is so fantastic. They make some really brilliant sparkling wine here, okay? If you want to change from champagne this Christmas or perhaps your budget isn't quite going into champagne territory, then get yourself, get yourself some Blanquette de, de Limoux or, or some Cremant de Limoux. You can put in UK prices, we're talking about 12, 13 pounds a bottle and they are really good. Traditional method, sparkling wine, okay? The um, Blanquette is made from the Blanquette grape, which is also, um, uh, which is lovely, also called Mosac. Whereas the Cremant is a slightly more modern version, and that's made from Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, and a bit of Pinot Noir. So there you go. Uh, not quite the champagne varieties with Chenin in there, but um, it's really, really good. Um, th they also, in Limoux, again, this is another example of why the Languedoc is so kind of a bit of a paradox sometimes. So it's a cool area, as I've mentioned. Um, it's quite windy with that, and they get a cool wind that's called the Tramontan wind up there in, in, in Lemieux. And yet, when it, they're allowed to make red wine under the Appalachian rules, good, thank you Appalachian rules. <laughs> the, the, the red Appalachian for Lemieux came in 2003. The great varieties allowed for Lemieux are, okay, Merlot, no problem, Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon, Okay, Cabernet Franc, Bordeaux varieties there, interesting. 
The one variety that's not allowed in Lumu is Pinot Noir, and yet the area makes amazing Pinot Noir. I mean, you don't get Pinot Noir in many parts of the Languedoc. It's a difficult grape variety. You need a cooler climate generally. Of course, Burgundy is its spiritual home. But if you do, do get a chance, try some, try some Pinot Noir from the Languedoc. It'll be from, it won't be, it can't be, it cannot be classified Appellation Contrôle de Mou, which to me is crazy. It's something called an IGP, Haute Vallée de l'Aude, which means the high valley of the Old Valley, which is the area where it's produced. Talk about IGP in a bit. So fabulous wine, not under the appellation system. I think that's nuts. Okay, by the way, talking of Burgundy, Alfred Bichet knows a major name in Burgundy. He's got some, he's doing some winemaking down in Lemoux. Oh, the other funny thing about Lemoux, just a little anorak fact, French appellation rules, don't you love them? Lemoux, if you make a still white wine in Lemoux, okay, it's probably gonna be made, made from Chardonnay or Chenin, uh, it has to be oaked until May of the following year, of the following year after harvest. It's the only white wine appellation in France that insists that you have to oak the wines, okay, until May of the following year. Okay, next slide, please. Again, just quickly here, this is Malpair, and you may have caught it on this map earlier, because I, uh, I think I probably indicated just at the very top left of the region, the climate is different, it's cooler, and even though we're a long way from the Languedoc, you do get, believe it or not, some Atlantic influence. What do I mean by Atlantic influence? Rain <laughs> um, and cool winds, mainly because there's some hills um, that actually block the Mediterranean when you get to Malpere and also this other one there, Cabades, which is uh, very close to Carcassonne. And so in Malpere, uh, and, and here's a, an estate that we featured at one of our tastings we did at, at the school last year, you can see that Merlot, which of course is the Bordeaux variety, has to be 50% of the, it has to be 50% of the blend, okay. And as we'll be coming to, um, when we're talking about Appalachian wines in Languedoc, we are talking, um, for red wines particularly, we're talking about blends. So they have Bordeaux variety like Merlot influencing Malpere and Cabades, which is the neighboring uh, Appalachian, again, very cool part of Languedoc, the great varieties there that feature Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Bordeaux varieties, but you can also blend in, but you can also use Grenache as well. Talk about Grenache in a moment because it's, it's the backbone of Appalachian red wine in the long crop. But it's definitely a transitional climate here. You, you really are a little bit of Mediterranean and a little bit of Atlantic, okay. Next slide, please, Lydia. GSM. Ah, this is my cue to have a sip of wine. So um, let's just take a tiny breather before we talk about Grenache, Syrah and Mourvedre. Is it worth um, seeing if there are any questions now, Lydia, or chat, or should we carry on? I can put to you a couple of questions if you think you're okay for time. Yeah. Um, so there's, no, there's not been tons, but just a couple. Um, First two kind of focused on irrigation when you're talking about obviously it being warm and in increasingly dry and the heat spikes at the moment, so quite topical. Um, the first one was, are wineries looking at irrigation to deal with drought? Um, and the second one was linked to that was, uh, are there any specific vineyard management techniques to overcome drought? Um, mm. and I know you mentioned the, the soils, but perhaps if there's, if you have any other Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> good points. Yeah, no, irrigate, no, good one. And thank you. There's something that I always forget. Rosé is one and irrigation is another. And you can, do, and irrigation, yes, you can. And it's a bit like Southern Rome. Um, it's, you know, if you can make a case or need, you know, there is a problem, um, you can make a case to irrigate and you will be granted the chance to irrigate. It's just a reality now. It's getting so warm and so dry but how can you not irrigate down here? It would just be madness. The reason there's been opposition to irrigation is because in the past it was associated with bulking yields in the bad old days, because if you irrigated vines, you could produce more wine and that was the bad old days. So that's why the historic, well, more recently there's been a slight nervousness about irrigation, but it's definitely okay to do so. And in terms of vineyard techniques, I mean, golly, 
anywhere now that you know where, where climate change is having an effect so that could be the way you manage the canopy the vine canopy maybe hanging on to more green growth shading your grapes possibly orientating your vines in a northerly direction so you don't get so much sun or sunburn all the things that we know are happening in other parts of the world absolutely really important Perfect. Thank you, Richard. And the last one wasn't quite so much. Well, sort of a sort of a question that's then having a bit of debate um, because you mentioned Lemu and sparkling wines, and uh, someone queried whether that was where sparkling wine was first created. And and now there's now a debate going on between Dom Perignon and Champagne and Limu. Oh. I like to throw England out there as well because of Christopher Merritt. So, but I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about that unless you had any particular insight um, from any producer or anywhere only, with uh, Limu that claimed to be the only that, only that I know, as other people know, that Limu claimed to have got there a hundred years before the Dom. <laughs> yeah. that's all i know and i think more importantly is it tastes nice okay and it's a good value option for a sparkling wine yeah. perfect all right we'll move we'll on anyway on. back to back yeah, to the we'll, longer dock and less we'll, about we'll sparkling. Crack on. good yeah it's just gone 22 7 so we'll crack on a bit here so grenache syrah morvedra gsm this is the backbone uh, as many of you will know of the red wines of the appellation system of of the longer dock Grenache, Syrah or Morvedra, it's not unique, of course, to Languedoc. The idea came, no doubt, from the southern Rhone, which borders to the east, and where, and a bit where the, the blend was much more firmly established. Basically, it was because Carignan and Aramon were kind of thrown out, of course, from the bad old days. They wanted to create something that was just more palatable, sustainable, could have lower yields and produce good wine, and that's why it came along. Grenache, as you know, is lovely and fruity and red, um, red fruits, thin skin, um, sugars, gets alcohol quite quickly. Where, but it's a brilliant blend, obviously, with Syrah, because Syrah has a bit more structure, more acidity, more tannin, slightly darker fruit profile. More Verdra, again, really late ripening, likes the, likes the really warm areas, but adds structure. So this blend really is, is the kind of backbone of the blends. And in the red wine Appalachian blends in the Longer Dock, um, the rules are similar if you if people are familiar with with the the Cote de Rhone. In other words, you've got you, you're allowed you you have to blend. Uh, you have the option of primary varieties and secondary varieties. Grenache, Syrah, Morvedre are always primary, and then secondary varieties would be Sanso, which also makes great rosé, and Carignan. Bad old Carignan is allowed as a secondary variety, but um, with a secondary variety, you can you have to use much less of it in the blend. So any Appalachian red wine in the long dot is going to be a blend. You can't have more than 80% of, of a principal variety. You have to have obviously more than one variety. They could be both principal varieties. And you'll have a ceiling on the amount of um, secondary varieties that you're allowed. So poor old Carignan um, would maybe not be more than 30% or something. Okay, and all the red wine and all the Appalachians of the long dot that have red wine Appalachians use this principle but they do vary within Appalachian, okay? And when you get down to Corbière, this is important, um, Carignan is actually a principal variety, which is interesting. Um, particularly as you're getting down towards Roussillon, where, Car where Carignan is also popular, and Spain, uh, where Carignana is an important great variety, particularly in Aragon in northeastern Spain. So there we go, we see this French uh, wine situation moving slightly into a Catalan, into a Spanish theme. It's interesting. Okay, let's, next slide please, Carignan, already mentioned it. Just a quick example, there you are, it's often, it's often historically a bush vine, it stands on its own like a little tree sulking, it's quite harsh, it's high, it's, everyone says it's high in everything except charm, high in acid, high in alcohol, high in tannins. Um, Carignan's actually also trending, isn't it now? If you think of other places where Carignan is, Chile, um, down in Mali in Chile, Carignan is a really trendy variety, particularly old vine Carignan. And you do find this in the longer dock. You'll often find the best Carignan is from 100, 110 year old vines. But often the way it's used and, and vinified is by using this process called carbonic maceration. I won't explain that and other to say, it's something you can do in the winery to extract the fruit uh, of the grape, but without extracting the tannins. It's a technique used in, in Beaujolais and other regions of the world as well. Carbonic maceration is important with Carignan. 
Next slide, please, uh, Lydia. This is uh, Minervois La Levinia. This is one of the Grand Cru's, if you like, of uh, the Languedoc. And um, Minervois, you saw on the map, it's a sort of north of Corbière. It's tucked under the Black Mountains. It's part of the Massif Central, uh, yeah, the Montagne Noir. And again, they have a fantastic location here. They're about 300 meters above sea level. Nice acidity in the grapes. They're facing, the, the vines face south. They're protected from the cold northerly winds by the hills. So they've got amazing terroir there. And La Levinière Appalachian, this crew Appalachian was formed in 1999 and they produce some of the best wines. I'm a bit biased towards saint Lali because they're available from the Wine Society and I'm drinking one tonight. But um, there are about 30 producers in La Lavinière from six communes around the village of the same name, La Lavinière. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, and so with La Lavinière, as an example of a Grand Cru, I mean, not always, but you don't have to hand harvest, it's up to the producer, but a lot of hand harvesting going on rather than machine harvesting to guarantee the quality of the fruit. And with La Lavinière, you cannot release the wines until January, a year and a bit after the harvest. Whether you choose to use oak or not is up to the producer. And in fact, the wine I'm sipping tonight, the Grand Vin from uh, Chateau saint Eulalie, the élevage, if you like, the aging, the maturation is done in the bottle. The producer, uh, the lead producer there believes that oak actually masks the flavors. And you know, we see this with red wine generally in the, and in the Languedoc also. That's 20 years ago when wines were quite heavily oaked, when everyone was chasing Robert Parker's scores, there was a very heavy style. Um, still around, and don't get me wrong, some oaking is fantastic, but generally speaking, wines now are being made a bit with a bit more subtlety. Oak is used, but it's probably older oak to help soften the tannins, but without imparting those oak flavors that you get from your oak. Okay, I think the point of the Grand Cru is, you get so much power with Grenache and Syrah and Mourvedre, the sunny climate, alcohol often 14, 14 and a half, 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol. Blimey, how can you get finesse into these wines? But believe me, the best producers can produce wines of 15 and a half percent and you don't even know the alcohol is there because there is such elegance in the wines and that is the trick. Because the reality is, if you're making wine in this part of the world, if you're just looking at alcohol, then you may not have full phenolic maturity. And that's the problem. What you want is delicious wines and they have to be in balance. If you get it wrong and the alcohol sticks out, then of course, that's the problem. Okay, next slide, please. Just need to mention him briefly. This is uh, Le Roi, Le Roi, the king of the Languedoc, Monsieur Bertrand. I'm sure many of you have heard of Gérard Bertrand. I mean, he's just an amazing guy. He's biodynamic, okay? He's been biodynamic since 2002. That means he's not just organic in his vineyard. He, you know, he's planting manure in cow horns. He's avoiding doing anything on Good Friday. I'm not taking the mickey by saying this. This is just the reality of the biodynamic movement. He believes in it passionately. He is a hugely successful businessman. He owns 16 estates in the Languedoc. He's got wine tourism going with a hotel and restaurants, all the rest of it. He employs 350 staff, uh, not just in the Languedoc, but in the States and in China. He exports massively, US, China. Um, he also used to play rugby for France. I really ought not to like this guy, but I haven't met him. I have tasted his wines and they are absolutely fantastic. And his Clodora, made in La Lavinière, Okay, it retails at an eye-watering £170, okay, uh, which who can afford that? These are kind of Bordeaux, Bordeaux prices or, you know, absolute crew classe, super premium prices. But actually, arguably, you need someone like that in the long run. Not too many of them, but you need someone like that because it helps raise the level of, of, um, of the quality of the production. And that's what he's doing. Okay, next slide, please. Just to mention something you'll see a lot in the Languedoc, Vin de France. We talked about Appalachians, Appalachian Controle. We're about to talk about IGP very briefly, but you'll also see a third layer called Vin de France. And Vin de France used to be called table wine. It used to be that really cheap stuff you get in a plastic bottle for about 50 cents or whatever it used to be. Um, but Vin de France actually is a good option in the Languedoc because it means if you're a young producer and you're setting off and you want to produce, I don't know, an Albarino, it's allowed, 
believe it or not, um, or with a van de France, you can do anything. That's the point. There are no rules. If you want to make wine from any variety or a blend, you can call it van de France and you can uh, then sell that wine. You don't have to comply with any regulations or rules. And the Viognier, uh, mentioned that label, Viognier is really on the best wines. You find it either as a van de France, sometimes in a white blend with one of the white appellations or as an IGP wine. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is probably another sign, you've, uh, another kite mark or label you've seen a lot, the pay doc. 50% uh, of half of, of longer dot wines are pay doc. And they came about because what happened in the 1980s, oh my goodness me, the new world, Australia, New Zealand, totally hit us with their amazing <laughs> varietal, single varieties, brilliant winemaking, clear labeling, telling us what we were drinking. It took the world by storm and the old world could do nothing about it. Well, pay doc was part of the answer to how you could make new world style wine in the old world. The pay doc was formed in 1987 and it's just massively important. So if you want to make 100% Cabernet Sauvignon in the longer doc, which you can't do with the Appalachian rules, you can make it as a pay doc. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, have to mention this guys very briefly as we're getting a bit short of time, but this is just the most unbelievable example of, of, of um, an IGP wine. IGP used to be called uh, Van de Pays, and it's now called IGP, Indication Géographique Protégée. It means it's not as strict as Appalachian Controle, but it has a geographical indication. The rules aren't as strict, but there are still rules. For example, the maximum yield might be 90 hectolitres per hectare rather than 45 or 50 hectolitres per hectare under Appalachian Controle. 58 varieties are allowed. That's a lot of varieties. So yes, you can actually, you can, you, you can actually have uh, Barbera in the longer dot. You can have uh, Albarino. There's a guy making, um, there's a guy called um, uh, Michel down in uh, Corbiere. He's making Albarino. Albarino comes from Northwest Spain, Galicia, but it's, <laughs> it's allowed under IGP. But these guys, Matadoma, Mastodoma Gasak, they hit the scene in the 1980s because these guys, they bought a holiday property didn't realize that they had some extraordinary microclimate and terroir, a kind of pink sandstone. And some wine enologist friends of theirs said, you've got to do something about this. I'll keep the story very short because we're running short of time. But in the 1970s, <laughs> they got some, they grafted, they took some cuttings from Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux, planted them in two hectares in their holiday property here in the Errol, which is you know, not too far from Montpellier. In 1978, they had their first, their first vintage of Cabernet Sauvignon, which was bottled in 19, sorry, yeah, which was bottled in 1980. Uh, and by 1982, Mastodoma Gassac has been heralded as the Chateau Lafitte of the Languedoc. And guess what? They, they started selling it for Chateau, not quite Chateau Lafitte prices, and they succeeded. And again, it's such an outlier. That's, that's the longer doc of the 1980s. That's unbelievable. You know, Cabernet Sauvignon, that's, that's Bordeaux territory. You can't do that. They said, yes, we can. And they did. They, had, they couldn't sell it because no one would take it seriously. They distributed it through their friends and family connections. But once people started tasting the wine and the journalists and the other people started noticing, that got the longer doc on the map. And as I said earlier, you need these people to get longer doc on the map. Right, let's move on. We're looking at black sheep. Just very briefly, it's just another good example of 21st century Languedoc. There are three guys, um, Robert Joseph, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He used to be wine writer for the Sunday Telegraph. He set up the International Wine Challenge many years ago. He, Robert Joseph, got together with a guy called Hugh Ryman, who's a, who's a winemaker in Bergerac, very close to where Liz and Topper and I were and a guy called Kevin, and um, the three of them created Black Sheep, basically a brand. Uh, you see the Black Sheep there in, in, the, in the vineyard, 
They're not the only black sheep uh, logo, but what they did was something rather brilliant. They wanted to make New World Wine uh, in the Languedoc. With very little facilities, what they did is they cut a deal with a, co with a super cooperative, i.e. a grand cooperative that looks after many cooperatives, dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of acres of vineyard. And basically, they bought wine from the super cooperative. Hugh Ryman was their genius winemaker. Like he's like a flying wine, you know, like a flying winemaker. He just flies into places and does winemaking in the off season elsewhere, Southern Hemisphere stuff. Blended it, made different blends. The, Kevin, the designer, made some incredible labels. They got this black sheep brand. They got a distributor in the States and they now sell 3.8 million bottles of Languedoc wine a year in 57 countries. Some, some of the wines they sell, they'll, they'll make a Minervois using GSM, um, but they won't sell it as AC Minervois. They want to sell it with the AC Languedoc, the generic appellation label, because they tell me that Minervois in some countries is seen as bulk cheap wine, and they'd rather have the branding linked with Languedoc rather than Minervois. Whereas their other wines like 100% uh, Merlot, or their white wine, which is fantastic, it's a blend of Chardonnay and Viognier, uh, is Paydoc. Okay, black sheep, very successful. And by the way, if you're in the UK, their wines really are lovely. You can get them through Robeson wines. Right. It's coming up to seven o'clock, so we'll really skip over the next slide. So just to say, Fougere, amazing terroir. Lovely windmill. I just like windmills. That's why I put this one on. I talked about the wind. It is a windy, windy, windy place. But also just to emphasize, 40% um, of Fougere, which is a red wine appellation in the middle, central of the Languedoc, 40% of producers are organic, which shows how important organic is. There'll come a day quite soon where people won't say, are you organic? It's like you're not organic or biodynamic or the next level down, which is HVE, which is Haute Valeur Environmentale. Uh, which is another way of showing that you're committed to uh, you know, responsible viticulture without paying the fees to be organic. It is important. Okay. And the next slide, we're nearly finished now. Just a couple of fun slides at the end. This is uh, myself and uh, friends. I think Alan's in that picture. I think he might be on, on tonight. Hi, Alan, if you're there. <laughs> this, is in, this is up at Pic saint Lou, um, about 300 metres above sea level, quite near... Um, uh, Montpellier, see see what see what the soil is like. It's so dry. It's like a it's like a moonscape. You can't believe that anything can grow at all, really. But there we are, feeling the vines, which is uh, Pic Saint Lou was only established as a red wine appellation in 2016. So it's very trendy. Lots of new uh, young winemakers are moving in, and the land prices are going up accordingly. But the wines are very good. Uh, nice cool winds. Lots of acidity in the grapes there. Um, it's very, it's kind of closest in character to, to the Rhone. Syrah is a really important part of the blend here because it's a bit cooler. Syrah likes it there. And the next slide, please. Just our little tasting table there uh, in the vineyard, in the Garrigue. You'll hear people talk about Garrigue. It's this lovely sort of um, smell of rosemary and thyme you get from the vegetation up there, sort of in the hinterland as you're getting up into the mountains and stuff, you get this natural sauvage kind of herby stuff going on and it's called the Garrigue and it's fantastic. You hear Lacoste, Lacoste as well. It just gives this sort of real sort of herbal character and I'm sure, I'm not allowed to say this, but I'm sure you can sometimes pick it up in the wines. Things like Grenache Blanc can be really kind of herby and delicious sometimes. I'm sure that's Garrigue in the wine. And you can see the sea in the distance there. I think it's about 30 kilometers away from Pic saint -Louis. You're never too far from the sea, remember. So just to wrap up the Languedoc, pros and cons is Mediterranean climate, environmentally friendly practices on the increase. It's innovative, it's dynamic. Lots of young people, young winemakers are there. The diversity, we've covered this. You know, you don't have to be just stuck in the Appalachian system. You've got great flexibility. Land prices are, well, certainly compared to Porto and Burgundy, they're affordable. So young dynamic winemakers can afford to start up there. If you're in Bordeaux or Burgundy, you'd have to inherit the land. You could, couldn't afford to set, to set out. It'd be too difficult. 
But on the downside, it's a confusing area. You've got Appalachian versus IGP versus Van de France. Marketing, how do you market a region like the Languedoc? I mean, I attended a webinar last week, which was talking just about saint Chinion, one Appalachian. And they were just talking about two different parts of that Appalachian and how they're gonna market it. I got a press release today about it. So how are, how are consumers supposed to know what saint Chinion means or what Minervois means? Minervois La Livinière, the crew, the Grand Cru that we talked about, La Livinière wants to separate from Minervois to be called La Livinière, but are consumers going to know what La Livinière is or where it is? I think it's tricky. And the price of wine. Um, of course, wine needs to be accessible to all. But also, whilst Languedoc still produces, I, I think it's fair to say, probably over, still overproduces in bulk to supermarkets who will pay a really low price for the wine. That is keeping the price of wine down. Now, some people say, well, that's a good thing. Who wants to be paying silly, silly prices for the wine? But it also makes it difficult if you're making wine in the Minervois and you're not La Livinière, um, actually to get a really good price for your wine. Um, so I, I would hesitate to say that overproduction, even in the 21st century, is still a bit of a problem. Okay, it's, but the other thing I would say as well, it's, it's still, as I said earlier, it's still early days. Um, this revolution really, I suppose it started in the mid 80s with the new world onslaught and the old world response to it. But what's going on now is happening in the past 20 years. So when you consider that Corbière and Minervois, they've only been Appalachian since 1985, and the new IGP system only came in 2009, it's still early days. It's a fantastic wine region if you can navigate it. You've got to know your producers, but you hear that everywhere, whether it's Bordeaux or Burgundy or anywhere else. Knowing your producers is important. But they are producing some fantastic wine and wine tourism is also increasing, particularly thanks to people like Monsieur Bertrand and others with their um, wine tourism hotels and restaurants. Last two slides, very quickly. Further reading, this book, is fantastic and has helped me very much, my understanding of the Languedoc, apart from having obviously visited, visited there a few times too. Um, published a couple of years ago, Rosemary George, Master of Wine, lovely lady too. If, you're, if you want to find out more, read this book. And finally, I think we should just say, at five past seven, sorry for overrunning, a little santé, <laughs> a little cheers. You're looking at, most importantly, you're looking at Topper, the, the black dog, who, although he's an old boy now, 12 and a bit, um, is still very well. Those of you who know him, those of you who don't, he says hi. The lady in the picture on the left, uh, that is Isabel Custal, who is one half of Chateau saint eulalie uh, She and her husband, Laurent, have been there since 1996. And um, they are, without doubt, one of the best producers in the Languedoc. And I'm afraid I'm in that picture too, as you can see. But anyway, I would just like to say thank you for listening. Sorry, I had to rattle through quite a lot of stuff there, slightly over, over time. But I hope you'll agree, wow, what an interesting wine region. It's got to be, it's got to be the most interesting wine region in France at the moment, if not in the world. Wow, there's a big statement. Time for a drink. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, that was so informative. I think, as you said at the beginning, you know, it's hard to do the longer doc justice in an hour. And I learned so much, yet I'm still now just intrigued. I feel like you just scratched an itch and I want to want yes. to dive in even, even more. But thank you for um, taking us on that, that whistle stop tour. Um, I've just put up a final slide, which obviously if anyone wants to get in touch or do any more events, you can sign up to our newsletter through our website or any online courses that we're still doing at the moment. Despite lockdown, you can still do your wine studies. And just, yeah, I'll just um, there's been far too many comments whizzing past in the chat now, thanking you for an excellent presentation. So just to, just to reiterate those, those thanks. Obviously, give my love to Topper. You know what a fan I am <laughs> of a Black Labrador. I will do indeed. Um, and yeah, enjoy your well-earned glass of Minerva. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an insightful 
look at the longer dog. Any any final uh, closing comments? I don't think so. I just encourage everyone to go there, and I, you probably want to close up the shop now. Are we taking any questions, or are we are we happy with the ones we did in the middle? There were just a couple, so I'll pop those to you very quickly now. So uh, one was about. Um, the ground being reasonably stony, did, uh, did that help control diurnal range at all for the rootstock? I'm um, oh. not sure if that's something. Good question. I need to get back to you on that one. <laughs> that's maybe an easy yeah, answer. Um, and then just the other one was Gerard Bertrand decide was there any push to go biodynamic sustainable but I think he then later answered it that and that the weather is very suitable for for that. The weather is really really suitable and I just very quickly mentioned again in, in Minervois Bertie Eden is an English guy he's been doing biodynamics nearly as long as Gerard Bertrand they call him the English professor of the Minervois and his winery is made of hemp that's how, how biodynamic he is well. building planning regulations because it's, it's made out of hemp so i mean sometimes we titter a bit with biodynamics and organic but you know it's it's here to stay it's increasing and, and quite right too perfect well thank you again and yes let's let's all go visit the longer dog the longer dog thank you very much lydia merci et bonsoir thank you very much everyone for your time sorry to overrun just uh, lovely to speak to you and i hope to see some of you again before too long